My fellow Americans, Memorial Day is a day of ceremonies and speeches. Throughout America today, we honor the dead of our wars. We recall their valor and their sacrifices. We remember they gave their lives so that others might live. The unknown soldier who has returned to us today and whom we lay to rest is symbolic of all our missing sons. About him, we may well wonder as others have. Did he marry? Did he have children? Did he look expectantly to return to a bride? We'll never know the answers to these questions about his life. We do know, though, why he died. He saw the horrors of war bravely faced them, certain his own cause and his country's cause was a noble one, that he was fighting for human dignity, for free men everywhere. Let us, if we must, debate the lessons learned at some other time. Today, we simply say with pride, thank you, dear son. May God cradle you in his loving arms. Well, good morning and welcome back to another wonderful experience as we gather online to worship King Jesus today. I'm Scott Weatherford and I'm so glad you're here. I want to ask you a question. Do you know why cannibals don't eat clowns? It's because it tastes funny. <laughs> I knew you missed my jokes. So welcome back and we're going to have a great gathering today as we focus in on Memorial Day, remembering the ones who paid the ultimate price for us. So we're going to go on this adventure today in our singing and our praying and our reflecting and, and of course, in the talk that I'll give later. Uh, so we just want to welcome you. If you're new today, uh, connected with us, just click on, say, hey, I'm new. Tell us where you are. Last week, we had people from 14 states in the United States and four countries in, in the world who watched us online. So we'd like to know who you are and where you are because we'd like to build your life and help you take next steps wherever you are. Now, some of you go, hey, I want to be anonymous. Oh, that's okay. We'll let you be anonymous. But at, from some point in time, you got to raise your hand and move forward with King Jesus because he wants you to take your next step. Now, speaking of which, online, we have our next steps process. And I'll tell you more about that at, at the end of this gathering. But we want to welcome you today. Now, we are making plans to start our in-house gatherings back on July the 19th. So mark that down on campus live inside July 19th. Now, between now and then, we're going to do some more outside gatherings, but we're going to continue to provide this online experience for you because we realize how extremely important it is for you. So we want to welcome you today. Now, don't forget a few other things. Let's know you're here. If you got a prayer need, a prayer request, click on that button and you'll be transported to a private prayer room where you, not, you know, like physically, we don't like zap you up and put you over there, but you know, you'll go over there virtually and one of our pastors will be glad to pray with you, whatever concern you have, whatever need you have. Plus there's other opportunities for decisions and for support because we are fully capable to do those things for you online. Also, don't forget to give. Your generosity has been amazing. Now, this summer, this church, First Baptist Church Wimberley, is going to be feeding hungry children throughout the Wimberley Valley. This is an opportunity for you to say, hey, I want to serve. If you live locally, you can do that. Email Scott Tidwell at fbcwimberley.com, and he'll put you to work serving kids. And your giving helps to do these great things that God has asked us to do, to literally feed uh, hundreds of children in this valley who would be hungry had it not been for the generosity of your support. So we give for King Jesus. We do. We give to do the good that needs doing, to love the ones who need loving, uh, because we are the church of Jesus Christ, the hope of the world. We exist to build lives that honor God all for Jesus. That means your life. So welcome again today, and let's go on this great adventure. Let me pray for us, and then we'll sing a bit, 
and then I'll be back to talk to you about freedom. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for what we're going to experience as we sing to you, as we hear your word taught, as we make commitments with our life. Thank you that you are so incredibly good and you've provided a way for us to be connected virtually or live on this campus. So thank you, King Jesus. We give this day to you. We pray this in your name. Amen. you 
To get honest, there's never been a better time to get clean. So come as you are, run to the cross and be free. Oh, be free. crisis, you really need to hear from someone with authority. During these crazy days, we can turn to the media, to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or any other social media. Or we can turn to someone who really knows what's going on. There is a theological word called foreknowledge. This word literally means to sit at a place that one can see from horizon to horizon. The only one who is seated that high is King Jesus. Let's listen to what he has to say to us in these crazy days of pandemic and pandemonium. Perhaps when we hear from him, all of our fears will be dispelled into faith. It's time to hear from Jesus. My daughter, Kayla, she's a graduate of the University of Texas, Hook'em Horns. I'm faithful through, you know, tuition. I guess you could say I've suffered from mal tuition. Sorry about that. But she's a graduate of the University of Texas. Now, I know you Aggies are right now going, whoop, whatever. Okay. And you Red Raiders are doing whatever. You Bears are doing whatever. You Frogs are doing whatever. Anyway, she's a graduate of the University of Texas. When she was uh, about to go there, we, we did a campus tour. Kayla was fixed on going to University of Texas since she was about a sophomore in high school. And she finished the top part of her class and, of course, was automatically uh, eligible for enrollment. So she seized it and she went to Texas. We did this campus tour when she was the last part of her senior year. And we went up and to Austin and we toured the campus. And it was a great day for Kayla and I as we went together, just her and I, just a, a chance to be away. And we started touring the campus and we uh, walked past the bell tower. And you Gosh, you know the iconic bell tower of the University of Texas. In fact, I said kind of snippy, I guess you can get some good shots from up there, which just wasn't very popular because I was referring to the guy that shot people from the bell tower, which was inappropriate and probably shouldn't have reminded you of that. But there it is. But all described on that bell tower is a description that said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. It's inscribed on this liberal university's bell tower. 
And so I looked at that, and the young man that was guiding us, I said, hey, do you know who said that? Who, the truth shall make you, you should know the truth, the truth shall make you free? He had no clue. Well, I have a clue. I think many of you do as well. King Jesus said that. And Jesus was talking about truth and talking about freedom and talking about the truth setting you free. And, and that's such a compelling statement that it's right there on the bell tower of the University of Texas. Now today, we're on Memorial Day, Memorial Day weekend. We're going to talk about freedom and what does it mean to be free and who paid freedom's price. Thomas Sowell said this, freedom has cost too much blood and agony to be relinquished at the cheap price of rhetoric. <laughs> now, obviously, he wasn't a politician. You know, we live in this days of cheap rhetoric where you have this side saying this side, this thing doing that thing, and of course, the confusion rants. But freedom is a valuable thing to us. So we should remember the price that men and women have paid for our freedom. You, it's God who placed the desire for freedom into the hearts of men and women. It's God who put that in us. Most great conflicts throughout history have been fueled by the desire to be free from tyranny afforded by governmental oppression or religious false piety. I'll look back through the pages of history and see how great things moved forward and how the, the martyrs have gone forward to pay the price of freedom that we might experience the liberties that we enjoy in our United States because others said they should not be the tyranny of oppression of government or of religious organization. Patrick Henry, the great freedom fighter from the Revolutionary War days, he said this, give me liberty or give me death. He was saying he would rather die than live in tyranny. And I understand that and being somewhat a history buff, I can hear that epoch cry of history realizing the truth of what we fought and bled for. While I lived in Canada, our, our uh, immigration minister, Jason Kenney, a guy, a friend of mine who's now the premier of Alberta, he made an offer to me. He said, Scott, uh, I think it's time. We, Tara and I had been there about three years. He said, you guys could become dual citizens, Canadian citizens and United States citizens. And, and I said, okay, what does that entail? He says, well, you have to pass a course on Canadian history and then you'll have to take an oath to the queen. I said, take an oath to the queen. She goes, yeah, you just take an oath to the queen. Uh, well, I say, I got a problem with that because um, I don't salute any other king but King Jesus and I'm not gonna take an allegiance to the queen. Now, Queen Elizabeth, fine, but she's not my queen. She's not my queen. Uh, she's the, the British queen or the Canadian queen. That's fine, what they wanna choose. But liberty as a United States citizen, as a patriot, has cost great price. In our great state, one of my favorite sites is going to the Alamo to see the 150 brave who stood against Mexican bellicose leader of Santa Ana saying, no more, we will be free. And they stood there in spite of their impending death. And they fought to the end. Santa Ana has been said to have quoted this. This is a quote from, allegedly from Santa Ana. As he sent his forces out, one of his generals says, if we attack the Alamo, many of our men will be killed. And he says, are our men just mere chickens that they might be slaughtered? See, Anna, Santa Ana had no regard for human life because he said in the place of power where human life did not matter. And the brave 150 said life does matter and freedom does matter. And all of them were volunteers, all of them. The brave 150 who fought for Texas independence. In fact, we still cry out today, remember the Alamo, remember freedom's price. So we're gonna journey today, not in cheap rhetoric, but we're gonna be as the ones called out by God for the movement to redeem men and women into the freedom that only Christ can bring. We're gonna pay homage to the ones who gave their life, men and women, to pay our freedom. But we're, then we're gonna look at the greatest freedom fighter who ever lived. And that is King Jesus. For we might fight the tyranny of government, but King Jesus defeated the tyranny of death, hell, and the grave. For us, that we might live forever. So let's go on this journey together. And remember that freedom is more than talk. It's the action of the one who sets us free. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for what you wanna to say to us this morning. And I pray that on this Memorial Day weekend, 
We will remember those who fought and paid freedom's price and honor them. But more importantly, I pray that we'll see you, the great freedom fighter, and surrender our lives entering into your kingdom of freedom. So thank you for what you're going to say. I pray that you speak through me, not my words, your words, not my thoughts, your thoughts, that we might live differently. And we pray this all in Christ Jesus' strong name, amen. Now I wanna encourage you to do some things. On, online there, you have some notes that you could download. And also you have some questions that you could follow the conversation, uh, our conversation we're having today, this talk, with some questions you could continue the discussion. So those are available online for you. Just scroll down your page, you'll see there where you can click in and get the notes that you can actually fill in on your device and ask the questions after the talk. This is a great thing if you've got a few people gathered in your home to continue the conversation, maybe even with your children, continue the conversation. We provide this for you because we love you and we want you to go deep. So here's some things that I wanna talk to you about today. Here's the first thing. We must remember the price of freedom. Freedom is not free. It costs someone something, usually great things. John Quincy Adam, one of our founding fathers, he said this, prosperity, prosperity, you will never know how much it cost my generation to preserve your freedom. I hope you make good use of it. Posterity, that you make good use of it. That we must remember that someone has paid our price. There's people who bled the ground red to fight for our freedom. As I look back at the history of my family, my mother was proudly a daughter of the revolution. I had one of my ancestors, Colonel Joe Causey. He fought in the Revolutionary War and he was rewarded a section of land in Mississippi for his efforts during the Revolutionary War. And my mother's family has pride in that. The Weatherford side of the family, oh, they were loyalists during the Revolutionary War and they got thrown out and had to go to the Bahamas. Some of them did that. Some went to Indian territory in Alabama and Mississippi and that's where my heritage comes from. People fleeing because they chose the wrong side. But we must remember that someone paid the price. In my own family, in my recent family, my father, a World War II veteran, he lost friends during the great struggle against the Nazi tyrannism. He, he lost one of his best friends, the man who led him to the Lord, a man named Charlie Cook, the night before he died, shared Christ with my father, asked my father to send information to his family because he said, in a prophetic utterance that I would die the next day, and he did, and two months later, my father knelt and gave his life to Christ in the Belgium Stowe because of a man named Charlie Cook who died for freedom. We must remember the price that was paid, but not just by our ancestors, but the freedom was motivated by the deep root of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We were not meant to live as men and women under tyranny. We're meant to live as men and women of the freedom of the rule and the reign of King Jesus who loves us perfectly. Freedom is entrusted to us and we have to remember the price that was paid. Now I'm going to go into a little more theological detail in just a moment about this price and I want you to wait for this but I want to set this up with this quote, listen to this. Ronald Reagan, the great communicator, he said this, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. Wow, he said that approximately 30 or 40 years ago, one generation away from extinction. And we see how our freedom now is being stretched. And the propaganda used by totalitarian governments perhaps are used on us today for social distancing and, and mask wearing. And I don't want to go down to conspiracy theory, but I think you know what I'm saying here. But God is placed in our heart. It's one generation away from extinction. He goes on to say, we didn't pass it along to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed to them to do the same. Handed to them to do the same. That it's not about the surrendering, but the reminding. One of the things I've learned as a leader is that people need to be reminded more than they need to be instructed. We have to remind freedom is not free. It's bought and paid for. Nelson Mandela, the great freedom fighter of South Africa, he said this, there's no easy walk to freedom anywhere and many of us will pass through the valley of the shadow of death again and again before we reach the mountaintop of our desire. And Nelson Mandela surely embodied that with his life. 
Today, we have a field of crosses that's displayed on our campus. And they, they serve there to remind us of the price that freedom brings. We created that visual to, to remind us about the price of, of freedom. During the Great War, or World War I, quote, unquote, the war to end all wars, there's a poem that was written to remember the price of freedom. Uh, allow me to share that poem with you. In Flanders Field, the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place in the sky. The lark still bravely sing, fly, scarce heard amid, amidst the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunsets glow, loved and were loved. Now we lie in Flanders Field. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from falling hands we throw. The torch be yours to hold it high. If you break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep though poppies grow in Flanders Field. That's an amazing point to me because it says that the torch of freedom is passed from generation to generation and it is not free. Men and women have bled the ground red to purchase it. But let me shift a second and talk to you about what's going on today in our world, that I want us to intentionally pause today on this Memorial Day, not only to remember the ones who've, who've given their life for us to purchase freedom, but also the one who are experiencing persecution even, even today. Uh, when we talk about martyrdom and persecution, we often think of the ancient days or maybe medieval times or perhaps during the Reformation, most of the great reformers that we stand on the shoulders of today theologically gave their lives and martyred them because of where they stood. Men like Johann Huss, who translated the Bible into the common language, was brought before a, a council of the church and they declared him to stop and he said he would not, so they burned him at the stake. Legend has it on the way to being burned alive, he said, today we'll light a flame that eternity will not extinguish. Wow. And today the persecution is still alive and well. Recently, well not re too recently, but a few years back I was in India and I saw the persecution of the Christian church there by the, the overwhelming majority of, of the devout. I've been into the Middle East where I've seen uh, Christians being ostracized because of their beliefs by other belief systems in Central Asia, in, in Southeast Asia. I've witnessed these things in Africa, even the persecution of the church. In Central America, some places, those things happen. Even in our own nation, denominationalism and division happens in the body of Christ that leads to persecution. We call that word martyrdom martyrdom. The word martyr literally means a witness, that we stood up and said we are the witness. But persecution is often the pathway to the exponential growth of God's church. God uses that persecution to set us aflame. As Johann Huss said, we will light a flame that eternity will not extinguish. Some have said that the seeds of the gospel have always been watered by the blood of the martyrs the witness of the martyrs. So today, in, in the middle of our gathering, the middle of our time, I want us to pause and to pray for the persecuted church around the world. Those who are standing up for King Jesus who experience the tyranny of persecution, whether it be cultural persecution, whether it be governmental per persecution, or maybe it be ostracization from even those in their family and friends here in the United States. But I want us to pray for the per persecuted church. So let's pause together while I lead us in a prayer for these, the witnesses, for King Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that no one has escaped your gaze. And even though we're harassed and harangued from every side, that you're the one who protects us and provides for us. Death is not our enemy, for you have defeated death. Persecution may be our pathway, but you're the peace who paves our pathway for your glory. And Father, I pray for those who are under persecution today, even some under the sound of my voice this morning are experiencing being ostracized or ridiculed because of their faith. And Father, I pray that in the middle of persecution, you will find us to be faithful. I know folks are listening, Father, from other countries where they may not experience the same level of freedom that we have in the United States. And I pray for them, Father. I pray that you will strengthen their faith and I pray that the gospel will glow glorious in the fire of the martyr 
that you will lead and guide and bring your deliverance and help to those who are undergoing this persecution today. So thank you that we can pause and remember and reflect. Thanking you for how faithful you are. Thanking you for the ones who bought us freedom from tyranny and the ones who shed their blood as an example to us about you. And we pray this all in your son's strong name. Amen. Amen. I know it may seem strange for me to pause because often we don't talk about that. But I want to shift our thinking right now. I want to shift our thinking to the very one we've come to talk about. Everything I've shared to this point has perhaps been inspirational, perhaps motivational, but nothing is transformational like the message of King Jesus. So we must remember the provider of freedom. It's not provided by the invading army or the overthrow of a government, even though God uses those as tools. Storming the banks of Normandy brought the beginning of the downfall of the tyranny of the Nazis. But the tyranny of Nazis is swept up in the tyranny of sin and death and hell and the grave, which is conquered by King Jesus. Remember the provider, Jesus Christ. He has paid the true price for freedom. So let me walk you through something I want you to consider today. How can you live in the freedom of King Jesus? Well, there's some things I want you to know. And then I want you to be introduced to something you must do to have a relationship with this one who brings freedom and bring freedom to you and your soul. The first thing I want you to know is that God loves you. Now, many of you go, yeah, I've known that. I, we used to sing that in, in, as, a, as a little kid. The Bible tells me so. Yes, Jesus loves me. And I've heard that song sung in many different languages all over the world. And it's true that God does love us. And love is a de demonstrated thing, not an emotional thing, not things of words, but God demonstrated his love for us while we were still sinners. Christ died. Paul wrote that to the church in Rome, and he reminds us of that truth today, that God really does love you. He doesn't love some future form of you when you have your act together. He loves you right now. He doesn't love you because you pontificate great truth. He loves you because he created you to live in his great freedom. God loves you. The second thing I, I think it's pretty obvious that you need to know is that you have a problem, so do I. It's a problem called sin. Now sin manifests itself in many different ways. It manifests itself in arrogance and pride. It manifests itself in rebellion. It manifests itself in, um, in addiction or, or, or perversion. Sin manifests itself in many ways, but the commonality of sin is rebellion against God. And God says this about us, for all have sinned and fall short of God's glorious standards, fall short of the glory of God. Now, I read that passage and I realize that there's none of us who escaped the power of sin. By one man, sin came into the world, that's by Adam and his sinfulness. And by one man, sin was defeated, and that's King Jesus, who died as a propitiation for our sin. And you're going, a propitiation for our sin, that is a big, big word. What does that mean? That means the one who's suitable to step in and pay your price. The one who's suitable to step in and pay your price. We owed a debt we could not pay. And that's the debt of sin. Now you can make a list of sins. It really doesn't matter. God doesn't categorize sins about their, their what well, he just says are sins. And we've all sinned and we've all forced, fall short of God's glorious standard. I like to give this illustration. I'm going to make breakfast for you and I have three eggs to make your omelet, but one of the eggs is rotten and I make your omelet anyway and your omelet is ruined and I serve you a ruined omelet and you eat it and you're sick because of rottenness in our lives. And sin makes our souls sick and we need a cure. We need freedom from our sin. And that freedom comes through King Jesus. You see, Jesus died to forgive you of your sins. All of them. Not some of them. Not the ones you admit. <laughs> I've discovered this about sin. We don't admit things until we're caught. And after that, we don't tell at all. We want to kind of do what I call sin management instead of sin forgiveness. I heard a preacher once say, I'm against sin except for the ones I enjoy. Well, you kind of get my drift on that. But Jesus died to pay for our sins. There's an old song that says, Jesus 
paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain and he washed it white as snow. I love that truth that Jesus is the one who brings freedom from my greatest problem. And my greatest problem is my sinfulness. And my sinfulness has separated me from God. But my God has come to reunite me with him and bring me the freedom of living in his love and life. Listen to what the pastor John said in his gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For good, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. I was reading something the other day and, and this pastor said, I've never looked at 16 and 17 together. And I've often looked at this, that God has not come to condemn me. He's come to save me. He's come to rescue me. He's come to bring me freedom not bondage and tyranny, not oppression, not legalism of religion, but the wonderful relationship with him that frees me from the burden and the bondage of sin. In verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in him is condemned already because we're all sinners, because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. So the question comes to this, will you accept what Christ has done for you? Will you admit that your sins have cut you off from God? Will you admit that you've been living in the tyranny of your own self-righteousness and you need the freedom that King Jesus paid? We memorialize and remember the ones who paid freedom's price politically or through war or through persecution, but will we surrender our life to the one who brings us freedom? Listen to what Paul said to the church in Rome. Because if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be set free. For you know the truth and the truth shall set you free. If Jesus frees you, if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. You will be saved. For with the heart one believes it is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. This is the promise of God. That if I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth, because my mouth closes the loop between my will of my desire and the knowledge of my mind, that I confess Jesus Christ, and then I'm free. Then I'm free. A few years ago, Tara and I toured Washington, D.C., our great nation, national, national capital. And throughout it is monuments to freedom, the declaration of freedom. And as I experienced all the monuments and I was reminded of the great price that freedom has cost our, our forefathers, we wandered upon a memorial to a guy named Martin Luther King, Jr., And I was moved because this was an ordinary preacher from Atlanta, Georgia, who actually pastored a church in Montgomery, Alabama. What good could come from Montgomery, Alabama? A movement that led to freedom. On his memorial, it said this, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. One day outside of a Memphis hotel room, a bellicose person pulled a trigger and took Martin Luther King Jr.'s life. And he died, but it did not end the movement. At that moment, when that bullet entered Dr. Martin Luther King's body, he became more alive than he ever was because he was not free until he was freed in heaven. And his legacy lives on as a freedom fighter. Now you might be offended by what I'm saying, but what I'm saying is the man who lived to offer Jesus is a man who was changed forever. And a man or a woman who lives all for Jesus is a man or woman who lives in ultimate freedom. Touring the University of Texas that day, I saw that bell tower. It says, you should know the truth and the truth shall make you free. I think the university was trying to proclaim that they are the ones who are purveyors of truth, but they are not. The truth that leads me to freedom is King Jesus. And he has set me free. Has he set you free? Has there been a time in your life where you've given your life to Christ? You've said, Jesus, I'm yours. I'm not talking about church. 
Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. It's just like going to a barn doesn't make you a horse. What changes your life is your commitment to Christ. Are you free? So this day of remembrance, this day where we pay honor and homage to those who gave their life for our country and for our freedom, will you be free? Will you lead your family into freedom? I pray that you will know the truth, King Jesus, and he will set you free. Free last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you for this time in your word. And I thank you that you are the freedom fighter. As we've honored those who paid the ultimate price for us, we remembered you have paid the ultimate price for us. That on your cross, your blood-stained cross, you paid freedom's price that my soul might be free now and free forever. And I pray, Father, that all under the sound of my voice have believed in their heart and confessed with their mouth Christ is Lord. Thus, entering into your kingdom of freedom. I pray, Father, that you will change their lives with that knowledge and they will live, although persecuted, maybe harassed and harangued, they'll live in the certainty of your freedom. So I thank you for what you've said to us today in your word. Folks, your heads are bowed and no one knows. In fact, you're probably sitting in the privacy of your own home, maybe surrounded by a few friends or family. But will you give your life to Jesus today? Because he's loved you. He has dealt with your sin problem. He has died to pay the price for you. There's no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood, and your blood won't do. The blood of God had to do. So Christ died for you. Will you give your life to Jesus? Will you simply pray this, Jesus, I'm yours. I give my life to you. And upon that prayer, will you just raise your hand and say, hey, Jesus, I'm yours. I give my life to you. Maybe you could click that button that says, I've raised my hand, and we We'll pray for you. If you want to remain anonymous, that's fine. If you don't, you can let us know and we will be glad to help you with next steps. Father, I pray that those who've heard me today also will be reminded that we have to carry freedom to the next generation. It's not passed on in the bloodstream, but it's passed on for those who live in your freedom and passed on to our children and to their children and to the thousandth generation. Not just the freedom of our country, Father, but the freedom that you brought through relationship with you. I pray we will be purveyors of freedom for our families and our friends into the future for your glory. Father, I thank you for the ones, the men and women who've died to pay freedom's price. But mostly I thank you for King Jesus, that he paid my price and I'm free in him. And Father, I know so many others right now are praying that same prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for paying my price that I'm free in you. And I pray this and we pray this in the strong name of Christ. Amen. Amen. I want to thank you for listening, giving the time to listen to this talk today. And I pray that it's been helpful to you. You may need to take a next step. Maybe you need to raise your hand and say, I've trusted Christ. Take advantage of that. Perhaps you need to say, hey, I need prayer and let us help you with that. Maybe there's something you can't get free of and you need others to help you. Uh, let us help you because Jesus put us together to make life rich. So step into that arena. Maybe it's the next step. Maybe you want to be a part of this family, even though it's virtual. You say, I want to be a part of this family. Click on that next step button and, and take those next steps. Watch that short video from me telling you about freedom and, and being a part of this family. Take, take that next step. Maybe you want to start a group in your home and you want to get, invite others to come and to listen to the content that we're providing. Take the next step and, and live all for Jesus. We want you to take that next step. I want to say this, uh, this year's been a strange year. <laughs> That's kind of an understatement. Uh, and it's been a really strange year for our seniors. Our seniors graduating from high school and college, we, we can't celebrate them. There's no gathering for them. There's no graduation for them. There's drive throughs and so, so forth and so on. And one of the things we pride ourselves here as a family at First Baptist Church is that we salute our seniors. But we want to do that today virtually. So at the end of my uh, pontification today. We're going to show a video and I ask that you stay online and watch us pay homage to our seniors. But I pray that today helped you. I don't want you to forget what God has done for you. And I want to encourage you to continue to be faithful. Step into ministry as God has given you an opportunity. Take your next step spiritually as God has prompted your heart and, and give generously that the kingdom of God may be boldly advancing because boldly bold men are advancing it. So God bless you 
and I'll see you again, maybe not live, but online. And I love you and I thank God for you. And I hope this has helped.